And before I came here, I was very fortunate to join the group of scientists and uh, religious leaders who made this trip to the Arctic uh, to witness the melting of the ice caps. And an entire way of life is being destroyed. You've seen the polar bears losing their ecological space. But the highest mobility in that part of the world is the dog sledge, and they can't use it. They're locked into their villages because the ice is now too thin to travel on it, but it's still there and therefore not good enough for them to use boats. Um, the same melting is making the Himalayan, uh, the Himalayan glaciers in my region, the Ganges Glacier, recede by 30 meters a year. In 20 years' time, the Himalayan glaciers will have reduced from 500,000 square kilometers to 100,000 square kilometers. And uh, given our rainfall patterns, in the hot summer season when we have a drought, it's only the melting of the glaciers that brings us water. So we are talking about one-fifth of humanity 20 to 30 years from now having no water in the grand rivers around which the grand civilizations of Asia have been built. And where did this start? You know, I mean, all this felt so timeless. And it started with humanity getting at the fossil fuel, which was never supposed to be touched. It wasted through pollution, and that's the carbon dioxide we are seeing, but it also wasted people. The wasted people of Europe could move to the Americas, to Australia, to Africa, but that model carries on. And globalization is now industrializing every activity of every human being's life across the planet. For me, globalization is really expanding the use of fossil fuel. And so while on the one hand, when we talk climate change, we are talking reducing emissions, the entire economic model is based on increasing emissions. It's based on increasing emissions by destroying small-scale peasant farming and introducing large-scale industrial agriculture. It's increasing emissions by making every one of us dependent on our everyday needs to come from China. Everything today is being made where it can be made most cheaply, which means where resources can be exploited the fastest and workers can be exploited the highest. And at one level, that's what's ref being reflected in, in China's double-digit growth and India's 9% growth. It's basically converting our resources into commodities to be sold around the world. But that conversion requires the wastage of human beings on a scale we've never seen. In India right now, the relocation of industry, for example, industry like steel that's shutting down in Europe and America is relocating to India. Automobile co companies that are shutting down in the West are moving to India. They're talking about making 50 million cars in India annually. Only 4% of India will ever own them. The rest will either be exported or that 4% will have eight cars rather than two. Already my landlord has five in a family of three. Um, those cars need minerals, they need steel, they need iron ore mining, they need aluminium, they need bauxite mining. And every inch of the land in India is today serving a global fossil fuel economy that's on fast forward. It needs land. Land grab is the biggest resource crisis. Land you can't create. You can only exhaust. But peasants are saying we will not move. That's what they said in Nandigram. 25 were shot dead and they refused to move. In Dadri, where women were raped and attacked, they refused to move. 
In place after place, the tribals, the peasants in India are saying, this is our land, this is our mother, this is where we will be. And when the money for compensation becomes bigger and bigger, I love this action, the Nandigram peasants sent a letter to the chief ministers to say, how much is your mother for sale? How much will you take for her? Because this land is our mother. And the globalization of agriculture has really become genocidal. It's hugely responsible for increasing greenhouse gases, whether it's from the nitrogen fertilizers or the fossil fuel in the mechanical uh, energy that's used or in the long distance transport and food miles. But on the ground, it's killing people. Long before it'll kill us through climate change, it's killing people, physically killing people. 150,000 farmers have been pushed to end their lives in India because of Monsanto seed monopolies, where Monsanto was collecting 2,400 rupees as royalty for a kilogram of BT cotton seed they were selling for 3,200 rupees. They're in, a, in the courts right now, we've, we've challenged them, we've joined one of the state governments. They're saying we have a right to this monopoly. And we are saying this, our country has never given you this right. They assume they got it in, in the United States and therefore they have it everywhere, whether the law allows it or not. O'Cargan wanting to grab India's wheat market, having signed an agreement through the Bush administration with, uh, right here in the city, decisions about agriculture are being made here in Washington, a two-year-old agriculture agreement. So Cargill eventually got India's wheat markets opened up, and the international wheat price is $400, Indian farmers are getting $200. And this double price is ultimately a subsidy that we are giving in addition to the subsidy your farm bill is providing to these corporations. Um, retail, India's a huge, huge land of, of bazaars, of hearts, of markets. Every street is a market. Hawkers come down in the morning get us our vegetable to our doorstep. Of course, that's not very good for Walmart, so they're manipulating zoning laws, shutting down hawkers, shutting down businesses in town, so that we will have a Walmart model. But that means 100 million people out of retail, and we don't know how much more carbon emissions while Walmart talks about going green. <laughs> I think uh, John has done some calculation, but you need to add the additional emissions. We've done it for what it would mean for a few hundred stores. But uh, Walmart, we just had a wonderful action in Chandni Chok, which is one of our oldest markets. Because Walmart had announced that in 10 years time, they'll generate 5,000 jobs. They're job creators. 100 million jobs in retail. Not jobs given by someone else, but self-employment, livelihoods. Uh, so, here you have globalization adding to emissions, and it needs to be a continued part of our work. And you've got four solutions that were laid out by Jeff. But the two four solutions that I think we need to pay particular attention to is the dominant solution in terms of carbon trading. Because at, at the philosophical level, at the worldview level, it's the second privatization of the atmospheric commerce. The first privatization was putting the pollution into the atmosphere beyond the Earth's recycling capacity. Now with carbon trading, the rights to the Earth's carbon recycling capacity are gravitating exactly into the hands of the polluters. The environmental principle used to be the polluter must pay. Carbon trading is transforming that into the polluter gets paid. Stern, who did the Stern Review, has clearly said it is an allocation of a full set of property rights to the atmosphere. And Price Waterhouse Coopers, who was very notorious in trying to privatize uh, with the World Bank help Delhi's water supply, and we defeated them two years ago in that project, has said that trade in carbon emissions is equated with the transfer of similar rights, such as copyrights, patents, licensing rights, commercial and industrial standards. One of the things we've always said in IFG, 
is the enclosures of the commons is one of the deep crises of resource depletion. Once resources move out of common management and public care, they will get further degraded. And if you really look at some, the clean development mechanism, it's all about dirty industry. It's about HCFC plants uh, being accelerated, new plants being set up in China and India, the biggest recipients of CDM credits in China and India. Are, are plants that are depleting the ozone layer. Spongine plants coming up in the tribal belts of India, in Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, and Orissa. Um, and clean seems to have become such a confusing word. We would have thought we know what clean is. And suddenly, everything dirty is clean. 